70 Weeks, The Historical Alternative Written by Robert Carangola Read for you by Paul Matrigine Produced with permission from the author This is a free TearingDownIdols.com audiobook. Reproduction and redistribution are encouraged. For more free reading and listening material, please visit TearingDownIdols.com Part 2 Tracing the Infusion of Error The Jesuits The Jesuits are a religious order of the Roman Catholic Church. Their proper title is the Society of Jesus. Originally, they were called Compania de Jesus, which is Spanish for Military Company of Jesus. They were founded, 1534-39, by Ignatius of Loyola. He drafted the rules that still govern the society. The training of a Jesuit is long and rigorous. Though not often taught, they were basically founded to combat the Reformation. Jesuit leaders played a major role in Rome's counter-Reformation. In the 16th and 17th century, this corps labored with measured success in reconverting Protestant areas in South and West Germany, Hungary, France, and Poland. They also made several aggressive attempts to reconvert England. The Christian Church is basically unaware that the Futurist School came from this society's scholars. Jesuit priests have been known throughout history as the most wicked political arm of the Roman Catholic Church. Edmund Paris, in his scholarly work, The Secret History of the Jesuits, reveals and documents much of this information. Their political intrigue has caused them to be banned from several nations throughout the course of their dubious history. Here is a brief list of nations and provinces with the dates they expelled the Jesuit order. Portugal, 1759. France, 1764. Spain, 1767. Naples, 1767. Parma and Russia, 1820. Several of these nations have once again allowed them entrance. The popes themselves know how wicked this order is. There is much evidence to implicate them in the death of Pope Clement XIV, who was poisoned in 1773. Footnote. William Cathcart, The Papal System, pages 462 through 464. And footnote. In 1585, a Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera 1537 through 1591, started to work independently. He looked deeply into the realm of Bible prophecy. The result of his work was a twisting and maligning of prophetic truth. Ribera's futuristic interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 was furthered by the work of another Jesuit, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, 1542 through 1621. These two were swiftly followed by a third, the Jesuit Luis de Alcazar, 1554-1613. through 1613. These men were the best soldiers Rome had. No one ever said Rome wasn't smart. Consistently, when she wants something done, she commissions her best men. Lord, help the Protestants to understand this effective principle. Let us quit raising up men who just agree with everybody. Instead, give us men of courage, truth, and wisdom, scholars who are passionately driven by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let's identify the areas of deception for which these papal warriors were responsible. In exposing the Romish apocalyptic expositors of the Reformation era, Eliot has given a synopsis of their prophetic positions. So at length, as the 16th century was advancing to a close, two stout Jesuits took up the gauntlet and published their respective but quite counter-opinions on the apocalyptic subject. The one, Ribera, a Jesuit priest of Salamanca, who about A.D. 1585 published an apocalyptic commentary which was on the grand points of Babylon and Antichrist, what we now call the Futurist Scheme. The other, Alcazar, also a Spanish Jesuit, but of Seville, whose scheme was on main points what we now designate as that of the Preterists. Footnote, Horae Apocalypticae, History of Apocalyptic Interpretation, page 465. End footnote. 
In taking up the gauntlet, these men could not have imagined that their works would be primarily taught by Protestants in the 20th century. For over 300 years, Futurism and Preterism, which we shall define later, were rejected by the majority of ministers as deceptive hermeneutics from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Futurism reigns triumphant, and Preterism is claiming to be the true alternative. God help us. It's time to dismantle this reign of prophetic chaos by clearly exposing the authors and their intent, and by establishing the truth which will scatter all contenders. When Ribera's commentary first appeared in England, it excited vehemently the indignation of the Protestants. The English expositor, Brightman, read the work and defiantly countered in his commentary. But mine anger and indignation burst out against the Jesuits. For when as I had by chance light upon Ribera, who had made a commentary upon the same holy revelation, Is it even so? said I. Do the papists take heart again? So as that book, which of long time before they would scarce suffer any man to touch, they dare now to take in hand to entreat fully upon it? What? Was it but a vain image or bug, at the sight whereof they were wont to tremble a few years since, even in the dim light, that now they dare behold to look wishly upon this glass in the clear sunshine, and dare proclaim to the world that any other thing rather is pointed at in it than their Pope of Rome? Footnote Horae Apocalypticae, History of Apocalyptic Interpretation, pages 465 through 466, and footnote. In his excellent book, Great Prophecies of the Bible, Ralph Woodrow summarized the prophetic doctrine of Ribera. Ribera published a 500-page commentary on the grand points of Babylon and Antichrist, in Sacrum Beati Ioannis Apostoli at Evangelistae Apocalypsin Commentarii, Lugduni, 1595. The object being to set aside the Protestant teachings that the papacy is the Antichrist. Ribera's writings are still found in the Bodleian Library, Oxford, England. In his commentary, he assigns the first chapters of Revelation to the first century. The rest he restricted to a literal three and a half years at the end of time. He taught that the Jewish temple would be rebuilt by a single individual antichrist who would abolish the Christian religion, deny Christ, pretend to be God, and conquer the world. Footnote. Ralph Woodrow, Great Prophecies of the Bible, page 196 through 197. End footnote. Does this sound familiar? Have we heard these scenarios all too often taught in Protestant churches? Did any of your teachers ever tell you who authored them? Even secular historians record the tactics of Counter-Reformation Rome. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, Under the stress of the Protestant attack, there arose new methods on the papal side. Footnote. Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 23, Page 213, 11th edition. End footnote. Ribera is identified as the founder of the Futurist School of Interpretation. William E. Biederwolf, in his Bible commentary, comes to the following conclusion as to the origin of the Futurist system. This school was launched in 1580, 1585, by the Jesuit Ribera, who, as Guinness says, moved like Alcazar to relieve the papacy from the terrible stigma cast upon it by the Protestant interpretation, the historical school, tried to do so by referring these prophecies to the distant future, instead of, like Alcazar, to the distant past. Footnote. William E. Biederwolf, The Second Coming Bible Commentary, page 569. And footnote. While editing Jonathan Edwards' apocalyptic writings, Stephen J. Steen commented, The polemical bent of Protestant exegetes produced an inevitable response from the Roman Catholic community. Near the turn of the 17th century, two prominent Jesuits wrote commentaries offering different interpretations of the Revelation. Francisco Ribera contended that the prophecies of the Antichrist were still unfulfilled. The Antichrist has to be a Jewish deceiver of the world who would reign for three and a half years. By contrast, Luis de Alcazar thought that the prophecies of the Apocalypse had already been fulfilled in the struggles of the early church with Judaism and paganism. The last two chapters of the Revelation, he said, 
tell of the triumph of the Roman Catholic Church. Footnote. Jonathan Edwards, Apocalyptic Writings, Stephen J. Steen, Editor. Editor's Introduction, pages 3-4. through four. End footnote. I will emphasize a fundamental truth once more. The Futurist School of Bible Prophecy was created for one reason and one reason only, to counter the Protestant Reformation. Ribera's primary apparatus was the 70 weeks. He taught that Daniel's 70th week was still in the future. He said that God had first given us 69 weeks and that at the baptism of Jesus in 27 AD, the 69 weeks concluded. He said that God extended the 70th week into the future to take place at the end of the age. It was as though God put a giant rubber band on this messianic time measure. Does this supposition sound familiar? This is exactly the scenario used by Hal Lindsey and a multitude of other current prophecy teachers. Remember, Ribera was not alone in his efforts to war on the Protestant cause. Cardinal Robert Bellarmina eagerly accepted the challenge and entered into the arena. Woodrow presents a relevant biography of this man's contribution to the confusion. The futurist teachings of Ribera were further popularized by an Italian cardinal and the most renowned of all Jesuit controversialists. His writings claimed that Paul, Daniel, and John had nothing whatsoever to say about papal power. The futurist school won general acceptance among Catholics. They were taught that Antichrist was a single individual who would not rule until the very end of time. But this effort to sidetrack the teachings that the papacy is the Antichrist failed to hold back the advancing tide of Protestant truth, at least for a while. Footnote, Great Prophecies of the Bible, page 198. End footnote. Let me add that Bellarmina followed very closely the teachings of Ribera. However, Ribera only partially attacked the year-for-a-day principle whereas Bellarmina declared absolute war against it. The systematic theology of interpreting divine time measures a day for a year when the text dictates has been almost entirely lost to the Protestant Church. However, the hypocrisy of the matter is manifest continually in the Futurist school. They are forced to acknowledge this principle of interpretation with the 70 weeks, but with other divine time measures, i.e. the Book of Revelation, they reject this great principle and try to teach that they are to be interpreted as literal days. By what authority do they do this? Ribera's, not God's. The Bible has several divine time measures incorporated in the prophetic utterances. Why aren't these time measures broken and separated from their contexts? The scripture cannot be broken. John 10 verse 35. Why do the futurists only take this liberty with the 70 weeks? I hope by now you are beginning to understand why. It's an infusion of error that futurist teachers can't explain. Why do they try to tell us that God broke the 70 weeks? We must examine this if we are to be honest with ourselves and God. I will substantiate that God never broke this great prophecy. Man altered it in his mind. Satan would deceive us all and rob us of our understanding of destiny. The breaking of the 70 weeks is the cracked foundation stone for futurism and dispensationalism. These interpretations must have their seven-year period at the end of time. Remember, this is the last week of the 490-year prophetic clock. All futurist scenarios revolve around Ribera's seven-year tribulation period. This erroneous presumption will be shattered as we proceed. Truth will triumph. It is systematic teaching that will usher in the return of the true historical interpretation and fulfillment of the vision. The implications of this will be self-evident and discussed in relation to the kingdom and the restoration of truth within its walls. The proper date and decree that signaled the start of this time measure must be established. The 70 weeks began in 457 BC and conclude in entirety in 34 AD. God's Word gives us an unmistakably clear signal as to when this period was to initiate and to culminate. The apostles knew they were to restrict their movements until that time span ran its course. This was necessary because of its exclusive application to the Jews. Further, it will be seen that the stoning of Stephen was not the end of this measure. God gave us a much more accurate indication. 
However, on the other end of the prophetic spectrum, our third Jesuit must be addressed. Luis de Alcazar attempted to divert the Protestant attacks by pointing 15 centuries into the past and planting Antichrist there. Alcazar wrote on the Ribera School of Thought. His book was entitled Vestigatio Arcani Senses in Apocalypse, published in Antwerp, 1614. He launched the Preterist School of Apocalyptic Interpretation. The Preterists consider the majority of the prophecies in the Book of Revelation to have been fulfilled in the downfall of the Jewish nation in 70 AD. Most advocates of this system date John's writing of the Revelation prior to 68 AD. Nero, they claim, was the Antichrist. This interpretation, in my opinion, is easily discredited. The Preterists find themselves in the same contradictions as the Futurists. The systematic theology of the year-day principle in the Bible prophecy thwarts their schemes. By what authority do Preterists say that the Revelation's divine time measures are interpreted a day for a day? Like the entirety of the Futurist camp, they turn around and say that the 70 weeks are to be interpreted as years, an immense contradiction. Alcazar's main thrust, like that of Ribera and Bellarmina before him, was to protect the papacy. His admiration for the Vicar of Christ is clearly stated. That Rome of old, head of pagan idolatry, by an admirable vicissitude, was to be changed into the metropolis of the Catholic Church. That the Roman Church was gloriously to triumph both in respect of the Roman city and the whole empire, and that the sovereign authority of the Romish Pope should always remain in the height of honor. Footnote, Horae Apocalypticae, Part 1, Page 468, and Footnote. Eliot sharply rebuked the Preterist teaching by referencing the understanding of Irenaeus, the grand pupil of the Apostle John. On the contrary, the early testimony of Irenaeus, disciple to Polycarp, who was himself a disciple of St. John, indicates a then totally different view of the apocalyptic beast, as if the only one ever known to have been received, a view referring it not to any previous persecution by Nero and the Roman Empire under him, but to an Antichrist even then future, one that was to arise and persecute the Church, not till the breaking up and reconstruction in another form of the old empire. Footnote, Horae Apocalypticae, Appendix, Section 2, German Neuronic Preterist Counterscheme, and footnote. In concluding the Jesuit infusion, Ecclesiastes warns us in a proverb that a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12. The threefold cord of the Jesuit writers has done its damage. The extent of confusion is almost unbelievable. I have often wondered how such great Protestant ministers could be so deceived. That question is left to the judgments of the heart, God's realm. The fruit, however, is what we must test. Thankfully, the historical chronology of Protestant responsibility is traceable and verifiable. It begins in 1826 with a man named Samuel Raffi Maitland. The Protestants S. R. Maitland, 1792-1866, was the librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was appointed by Archbishop William Howdy, Keeper of the Manuscripts at Lambeth Palace, London, where the massive library of the Church of England was kept. It was then that Dr. Maitland discovered this futurist view of the Revelation, as taught by Francisco Ribera from Spain, and he published it just for the sake of interest. Footnote. Thomas Foster, The Pope, Communism, and the Coming New World, page 2. End footnote. These events began in 1826. At this time, the vast majority of American Protestants were historicists. It is understood that Maitland had much contempt for the Reformation, and he did not believe that the papacy was the predicted anti-Christian apostasy or beast of Daniel and the Apocalypse. I challenge you to find one Protestant who believed the futurist teachings of the Seventy Weeks before 1826. It is impossible. 
Dr. Maitland wrote a prophetic pamphlet in which he challenged the generally understood year-day view of the 1,260 days of Daniel and the Revelation. This was in 1826. In 1829 and 1830, a second inquiry into the same subjects appeared. To make things worse, in 1833, the Oxford Tracts were published, whose main object was to deprotestantize the Church of England. Error was now tumbling into the Protestant theological mainstream. A consuming virus had set in, and it will take its toll for decades to come. In 1851, the brilliant Eliot published the fourth edition of the Horae Apocalypticae. In this massive work, he refutes the most intellectual and witty counter-schemes, several of which have already been mentioned. However, his main concern was the damage already being done by Dr. Maitland. He addresses this concern in the preface to the fourth edition. At the time when the author's thoughts were first seriously directed to the study of prophecy, the Rev. S. R. Maitland's publications had begun to make an evident impression on English theological students more specifically, such as were investigators of prophecy, and had caused doubt in the minds of many, not only as to the correctness of the old Protestant anti-Romish views of the Apocalypse, and of the prophetic year-day theory therewith essentially connected, but doubt whether the Apocalypse had as yet received any fulfillment in the past history of the Church and Christendom. Maitland's errors were magnified by John Nelson Darby, 1800 through 1882. Darby read the pamphlets that Maitland produced and was persuaded. This man was the founder of the Plymouth Brethren. He thought this was a great revelation. With such a simplified view of Bible prophecy, there was no need to understand the historic application. It was all in the future. Darby wrote several volumes on this new understanding of prophecy. He influenced many people, including Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, 1843-1921. through 1921. To make things worse, Darby's views were incorporated in the Schofield Reference Bible, 1909. Darby, in turn, was followed by William Kelly. This relationship, which included many others, is summarized by Alexander Rees in his unmatched scholarly refutation of the pre-tribulation rapture teaching, the rapture theory will be discussed later, entitled The Approaching Advent of Christ. About 1830, a new school arose within the fold of premillennialism that sought to overthrow what, since the apostolic age, had been considered by all premillennialists as established results, and to institute in their place a series of doctrines that had never been heard before. The school I refer to is that of the Brethren, or Plymouth Brethren, founded by J. N. Darby. It will be convenient to give a summary of the new doctrines, with extracts from writings of the four pioneer writers who filled evangelical Christendom with their teachings. I refer to Darby's Lectures on the Second Coming and Notes on the Apocalypse, Kelly's Lectures on the Second Coming and Kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ's Coming Again, and Lectures on the Book of Revelation, Moulter's Plain Papers on Prophetic Subjects, and C.H.M.'s Papers on the Lord's Coming. In America, the new teachings were spread abroad through W.E. Blackstone's Jesus is Coming and numerous writings of F.W. Grant, J.M. Gray, A.C. Gabeline, F.C. Ottman, and C.I. Schofield. But all these followed the lead of the British or Irish pioneers. Schofield's reference Bible represents a lifelong study of the Scriptures, and is hailed in all the world by brethren as setting forth their views on the interpretation of Scripture, especially of prophecy and dispensational truth. And naturally, Schofield was for a generation an assiduous and admiring student of Darby's writings. In A.C. Gabeline's many writings, the influence and spirit of William Kelly are everywhere evident. Footnote, Alexander Rees, The Approaching Advent of Christ, page 19. And footnote. Today, the ripple effect of these men's teachings fills the Christian bookstores. I am not attacking their great Christian lives, only that which they wrote on eschatology. Fortunately, 
many students of Bible prophecy are turning away from the futurist school of interpretation. It is to be hoped that they will not be deceived by the new wave of preterist teachers. Theirs is not the true alternative. The erroneous futurist predictions during the decade of the 1980s have left many people confused and disappointed with prophecy teachers. God's people are once again recognizing the providential hand of the Lord upon them. They are refusing to endure teachings which are confusing and contradicting. I hope this brief chronology will encourage you to question the roots of many prophetic teachings you have heard over the years. Remember, if the root is bad, how much more rotten the fruit will be. Don't let men keep you from being a Berean.